And I want to begin by commenting on uh, what I thought was an original analogy of a house being on fire. But uh, sadly, we've heard it previously in the meeting of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration. At the time, it was uh, when the house is on fire, it's not time to uh, start painting the house. Today, it's uh, when the house is on fire, it's not time to buy tires for a truck. Uh, when I think the reality is when the house is on fire, let's not forget the people who are inside the house, including people inside the house who uh, may be risking their own lives to save life and property, if we want to have that analogy. But let's get back to the actual topic of today's hearing. Uh, when uh, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or the DACA program, was first announced by President Obama nine years ago today, he said that the program was not a path to citizenship or a permanent fix. It was a temporary stopgap, but would provide some relief and hope to talented young people while Congress would work on the permanent fix. DACA was rescinded by President Trump in 2017 and has been litigated in the courts for years. So far, it's been largely upheld by the federal courts. Those are the facts. So my first question is for Mr. Rodriguez. You were part of the Obama administration when DACA was announced. Why do you think the Obama administration focused on this specific population, and why do you think the program has largely remained intact over the last nine years, particularly in light of the legal challenges? Yeah, I, I think members actually in this committee on, on both sides have, have uh, uh, alluded to the reason, and that, that is that it is a population uh, that is viewed as blameless. Uh, they came here uh, by whatever different means uh, as children. Uh, and, and therefore, there is actually a broad consensus among the American people and among our political leadership that this is a population that deserved that relief. Uh, and for that reason, uh, this was meant as a, a, a stopgap in two ways, actually, Senator. One is a stopgap for uh, the DACA recipients themselves, but also as a stopgap in terms of addressing this population first, not saying that this would be the only population. Uh, that would benefit from 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 relief. Thank you. Uh, changing the topic uh, slightly uh, for the next question, I want to make reference to a 2018 uh, article by the Military Times where they estimate that there's uh, nearly 12,000 service members who have a spouse or family member at risk of deportation. This means that there's currently American troops who in addition to carrying the heavy burden of protecting our nation and taking care of themselves in dangerous situations, have the additional worry that one of their family members may be deported when they come home. These are service members putting their lives on the line for our country, and yet we cannot provide for them the peace of mind that the fa their families will be there intact when they get back. Now, the military prides itself on providing support for family members, for service members, and this seems like a pretty big oversight. So my question is for Mr. Pontieu. According to your written testimony, you have a United States citizen son who is currently serving in the U.S. Army. Yes. Can you just share with us how he may feel about you and your wife not having permanent status in the United States while he's on active duty? Uh, he's, uh, my, his name is Christopher Pontio, and he's a reserve in the U.S. Army. He just came from deployment. He was uh, deployed for 10 months, and he feels that it's unjust. It's not fair that his family are facing deportation when he put his life on the line to protect the country. So I think we can change that. I cannot do anything but you. You can change it and make it fair for the TPS holders and DACA recipients. Okay. Thank you both, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses. We now turn.